Chapter 2 In Spite Of Difficult People I wish I could change my boss's disposition. He is getting unbearable, and I could cheerfully wring his neck. How do you suppose we can keep Jenny from talking so much? She's like a parrot. It is beginning to get on my nerves. How can I change my wife? She's a good woman, but she keeps the neighbors in an uproar. How can I change my chief clerk? He is so negative and unresponsive that people are complaining about him. As one moves among his acquaintances and friends today, he is impressed by the fact that so many persons are out of harmony with themselves and with others. Everywhere one finds someone who is willing to change almost anything or anyone in the world but himself. No matter where we are or where we go, we run into diseased egos. In the church, in the home, the lodge, office, difficult people are among the most pressing of problems. It is human nature to try to meet the difficulty by attempting to make the obnoxious individual over. How can I change him? How can I change her? What can I do to change them? We ask ourselves. The truth of the matter is that we cannot change anything or anyone but ourselves. That may come to a shock to the person of Mr. Fixit, who is always so busy about changing others, but it is true. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What does it mean to let your light so shine? It means to see the kind of example that will inspire others to change themselves. This is the first part of the process. The other part is to work upon your own consciousness. You thought this was going to be a lesson about the other fellow, but it's really one about you. Now mark this well. If you do not have an affinity for the disagreeable traits and personality defects that you see in other people, you could not experience them within yourself. You could not see them. It is a fact that what you see to criticize in the other fellow must first be in yourself. Is that a bitter pill to swallow? And let's see why it's true. You and I live in two worlds at the same time, a world of matter, material things, and a world of consciousness. Between the two worlds, there are five senses that keep the consciousness informed as what is going to be on in the material realm. Right now, you may be sitting in the mezzanine of a beautiful hotel. You are surrounded by luxurious appointments, furniture, writing desks, pictures, and by well-dressed people. How do you know where you are? Your five senses tell you. They relay sound, sight, odors, and other sense perception to the brain, and you then identify yourself within your environment. You tell yourself that you are in the mezzanine of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, that an orchestra is playing, that many people are moving about. In other words, you interpret these impressions in terms of your understanding and your past experience, and you may arrive with a sense of worry, annoyance, and discomfort. Another person in the same environment might get an entirely different response as a result of his interpretation of what his sense reports. It is obvious that people, circumstance, and events are to you what your consciousness reports them to be. That is why Jesus could see good in everything and in everybody. Being filled with the consciousness of God's presence, he responded only to the good. Does this sound too abstract? Then let us put it this way. You do not see a person as he is you see only your reaction toward him. If the response reports a defect in another, you have a defective consciousness. That is why Jesus said, Why beholdest thou the mole that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thy own eye? The person who annoys and angers you is not your home or office, but in your consciousness. You are never dealing with a person. You are dealing only with your own mental reaction to him. Are you finding fault with someone who is malicious, unpleasant, hateful, or annoying? Then you are dramatizing a specific state of consciousness. You are judging another, and by your false appraisal of him, you are judging yourself. You are, so to speak, blaming another person for the fault that is within you. The psychologist would say that you are projecting your own limitation. The unholy habit of criticizing others is often only an excuse for not facing one's own weakness. When a man asked Dwight Moody how he could overcome his habit of exaggeration, he said, Why don't you begin by facing the fact that what you call exaggeration in yourself, you call lying in other people? Moody was right. All reformation and reconstruction begins within the self. To transform another person, we must first transform our own ego. When you get right with yourself, everybody else will be right with you. 
Isn't that a wonderful thought? How then shall we proceed with this process of change? The first thing is to weed out from our own consciousness all the negative attitudes that have taken root and to cultivate only positive attitudes. This will require time and effort, but it can be done. If we will check our own motives, guard our thoughts, and be as indulgent and considerate of other people as we are of ourselves, we can bring about a desirable change. The second step is to discipline our egos. Each of us must ask himself these questions. How do I react with criticism? Do I fly to my own defense? Do I study it to see if it is justified? How do I react to my own mistakes? Do I freely admit them? Do I try to cover them up? Do I syndicate them? Deflating the ego is a difficult task that pays great dividends. After bragging about himself to his boy, he said, Yes, son, I am a self-made man. The son replied, Gee, Dad, that's what I like about you. You take the blame for everything. Robert Burns said in Immortal Words, O oh, wad some power the gift did give us to see ourselves as others see us. Some of our friends would be very happy to tell us how they see us, but they know that our ego could not take it. We, as a rule, do not want to be changed. The strongest motivation for change is good example. The most successful sermon is one that reveals people to themselves. But there is always someone present who expresses a wish that some relative or friend could have heard it. We do not want people to tell us the truth about ourselves. We want them to tell us what we want to hear. When Jesus said of a certain man, but he desiring to justify himself, he was also talking about you and me. The ego, out of control, has an instantaneous defense reaction. It always seeks a way out. Right or wrong, we tend to defend or justify what we say or do. We say it because I did it because blank, or I said it in spite of blank. Perhaps we should pray the prayer of the public and more often. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It is a salutary thing to deflate the ego periodically. Nowhere is it more important than in one's relation to other people. If you know why you do certain things, that is half the battle. Go over your motives, response, and reactions, and you'll be amazed at how you are letting yourself down. That is how poorly what you do measures up to what you know is good to do. If you catch yourself projecting your own limitations into another, take your ego in hand at once. Put it in its place. Do you like to assert your superiority? Do you like to talk down to people? Do you like to direct them, regiment them, or change them? Do you demand love and respect? Are you long on condemnation and short on appropriation? Do you make it hard for others to discharge their obligation to you? Do you forgive but not forget? Do you high-pressure customers and divine your good? Do you try to tell to impose your will upon the divine will? Do you like to cram knowledge down the mental throats of your children? If your answer is yes to these questions, your ego is diseased. The successful leader in any field is not the reformer but the revelator. The successful salesman does not force his merchandise upon his customer. He creates a desire for it. The successful teacher stimulates thinking by drawing knowledge from within the student. Sometimes I feel like saying to the egotistical, self-important and self-righteous, what Jesus said when he came into Galilee, Repent ye and believe the gospel. That is, shift the load, get right with God. Get on the right side of the law. Let your light so shine. Don't get all puffed up, don't brag, don't push, don't shout. We know you think you're on top of the heap. Come down off your perch and be one with us. Fill your mind with the consciousness and the presence of God, and nothing but good will come into your life. If you want to change other people, you have only to change yourself. You have only to heal yourself and what you think is wrong with them. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Can you glorify God without receiving something yourself? Can you let your light shine without lifting your mental level? Would you change the other fella? Then be an example to him. Show him what it is to mean to live up to the best that is in him. Make your example so attractive that it will create in him a desire to change himself. This is not only the painless and effective way to change others, but it, the only way. By their fruits, said Jesus, shall ye know them. 
St. Paul said, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you realize that you are the only thinker in your world, you will see that the only things that have to be changed are your states of mind, your reaction, your responses. Disagreeable people are not out there, but in here, here in your consciousness. They are to you what you conceive them to be. They react to you according to your mental image of them. A person is not essentially ugly, cantankerous, and difficult, regardless of his appearance. He needs to meet just one person who is big enough to see what he really is in order to make that reality visible to everyone. Since you and the offender are both in the one mind, it is in mind that the change must take place. You do not have to put up with difficult people. Instead, you have to think right about them. Instead of looking upon them with hopelessness, despair, and defeat, see through the appearance of imperfection and behold them as they are in God. Instead of becoming embittered about the people, handle your thought about them. Rise up in the consciousness of Christ's mastery and declare the truth. Say with St. Paul, Christ in you the hope of glory. Every time you think of an individual whom you have looked upon as a problem, say, I know the Christ is there within you. I shall not rest until he comes forth. Continue treating in this manner until your thought is clear, your attitude true, and all criticism and judgment will have been made. The clarification of your own image of the person who annoys you will have produced that change. Therapy 1. Be kindly affectioned one to another. It would be wonderful if everyone liked everybody else, but there are personal equations in each of us that make this desirable state impossible. The best discourse on personal development is to be found in the Epistle of Paul, the Apostles to the Romans, chapter 12. St. Paul tells us that among many things which we should construe as reasonable service is to live peaceably with all men. And this is good advice, for it takes the depression and anxiety from the dead spots in human relations. 2. Take an interest in unattractive people and love them. This is not easy in some cases, but we shall never find their lovable qualities until we call them forth. If we keep looking for a person's fault instead of his possibilities, he will never change. Jesus always looked for the good in people, and he brought it forth. In the company of sinners, said Hugh Black, the author of The Comrade in White, he dreamed of saints. If you want to change people, do not try to get them interested in you, but you be interested in them. Give them a chance to talk to you about themselves and their operations. 3. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all on the house. Some people are like the stained glass windows at an unlighted church. They appear to be dead inside. But the light is turned on, they glow with warmth and color, they radiate beauty and brilliance. But how does one turn on the light in the soul? By centering his thought in God. 4. Study people with a view to helping them, but study yourself more. If people are always getting on your nerves and upsetting you, it is reasonable to suspect that there is something wrong with you. Maybe your own vibrations are irritating or depressing. Perhaps you rub people the wrong way. There is a reciprocal action between inharmonious persons. It is wise to find out which one is projecting the friction. You can determine this responsibility only by analyzing it. 5. Practice praise instead of criticism. Pronounce a approbation instead of a condemnation. If you spend your time criticizing and magnifying the faults of others, you shut out the good. I like the story of Jacob and his sons who went down into Egypt to buy food. Everything was packed, the best fruits in the land, balm, spices, myrrh, nuts, almonds, and, mon and honey. Then Jacob said, Take a little honey. Why honey? Because honey would sweeten the journey. It is smooth, kind, soothing. It has all the qualities necessary to win people to make friends. That is what we need in human relations today. Honey instead of vinegar. Praise instead of censure. When you start out on a change people, don't forget to take a little honey. Kindness and praise will turn the trick when everything else fails. 6. If you have a hard time changing your mental concepts of an irascible and unlovely person, try listing his good qualities on a piece of paper. Since Christ indwells every man, you will find spiritual qualities in him if you hunt for them. Make an exhaustive study of him. 
try to add something new and good to your list every day. This practice will not only help to glorify the person in your own mind, but it will change your reaction to him. If you build a new and positive belief about a person in your mind, he will consciously or unconsciously strive to live up to new belief. 7. Always keep in mind that it is you who must change and not the other fella. If you get along with yourself, others will get along with you. When your ego is out of control, everybody you meet will probably be a bit disturbing to you. Jesus said, By this all men know that ye are my disciples, if you love one another. Meditation Since I am the only thinker in my universe, I can change. Only by changing my own consciousness or mental concept of him, I refuse to let my reactions or beliefs about him disturb my happiness or peace of mind any longer. I love God with all my heart, soul, and strength, and I will love blank as myself. I see only the Christ in him. I refuse to see anything else. I will not think that this person is annoying or difficult. I reject what my sense tells me about him. This person is a spiritual being made in the image and likeness of God. I see him as God sees him, perfect, true, kind, gracious, and cooperative. I am his friend, and my friendship dissolves any discord and harmony and ill will. My relations with him are permeated through with the utmost warmth, love, peace, joy, happiness, and goodwill. The Treatment This appearance of imperfection is not true of God. Therefore, it is not true of blank. I know nothing but presence and power of God in him. I consciously embody only those ideas that set forth his wholeness and perfection. I refuse to accept or believe anything else. Repeat the treatment each time you think of an individual until the old factors of causation are no longer active in your consciousness. You can quicken the process by meeting each old thought as it appears. Gradually the person will change and your original reaction will wither and die. You will have changed the disagreeable person by changing yourself. You will have broken the bottleneck. End of chapter.